Good morning, Mississippi Avenue. How are you doing today? Very good. I want to start something today that's just, it's going to be awesome. Something we should do every morning. We're, we're going to celebrate the fact that not only is our, our Lord our Savior, but He's our friend. Please stand with us as we sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forbear. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is it trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Comfort with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. It is hard to take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a soul and say. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a soul in Now our, our friend, Jesus, he wants to talk with us daily. He wants to have a conversation, but sometimes we need to prepare ourselves. We need to actually ask the Lord to open the eyes of my heart. Please sing with us. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Sing it to him. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, to pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Tell them. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, 
shining in the light of your glory. And pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. Sing with me. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. seated as we celebrate believers baptism good morning church family morning. it's always great to have a baptism is it not amen, amen. well we've got a great story uh, this morning of a family the entire family coming to christ and making a decision to follow Jesus and make him their Lord and Savior. It all started on Tailgate Sunday. And that's why we do those types of events. This family joined us on that day, heard the message. Mom and dad came to the Lord. And then a few weeks later, their two sons came to the Lord as well. And so it's a fantastic story of what God can do when we are faithful to invite and to open our doors. And to just welcome those people in. I love hearing stories of salvation. And how we all came to know Christ with a friend, a co-worker, or a neighbor. And today is no different. And so, Nathaniel, we're going to start with you this morning. You can see all those smiling faces out there. Everybody's excited for you. I just have one simple question for you, buddy. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, my friend. Well, it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you, my friend, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Mr. Byron, come on in. The water's warm this morning, so you're good, all right? Make sure you look there and see all the smiling faces. They're all proud of you. The church is here to stand behind you guys and to walk with you through the discipleship. And you enter middle school here next year, I believe, right? It's a fun time, all right? I know Pastor Bill is excited about that. But Byron, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, my friend. It is my privilege and my honor to baptize you my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Come on in, Mom. This is Miss Donnell. Say hi. <laughs> we all know the power that a mother has in the family, right? And she's done a wonderful job here bringing her boys to Christ, and so we're so excited about that. So just one simple question for you this morning. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Awesome. Well, then it is my privilege and my honor to baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, pray to Christ, raised and walk in the of life. Come on in, Lewis. This is Lewis. Say hi. So it's kind of an awkward moment when you're getting baptized, right? You're standing up here looking at all these smiling faces, but... I just want to say a real quick word about Lewis. This is something that is uh, important to me as a pastor and to Pastor Mark and all of our staff and as all Christians. But we know statistically that when the father comes to Christ and comes to church, he brings the family with him. And Lewis is a prime example of that. He is excited to lead his family to know more about Jesus, not just to begin the relationship, to accept him, but to grow in their discipleship. And so we're so excited about that. Lewis, my friend, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and made him Lord of your life? Awesome. Well, my brother, it is my privilege and my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ and raised to walk in the of life. Let's say a quick prayer this morning. Father, 
We are so thankful for just the honor and the privilege this morning uh, to walk through this baptism. What a beautiful picture of what you've done for us, Father, that you came, that you lived, that you died, you were buried, and you were raised again, Father. And just as that, we go through this process to signify that in our own relationships with you. Lord, we love you, and I thank you for Lewis and Danelle and Nathaniel and Byron this morning, Father. And I just pray that you would be with them. May this church support them and love them, Father, as we all grow and walk with you together. We give you the praise in your son's name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church family. Excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, as you may know, uh, Pastor Bill is leading a mission team uh, to San Luis, Mexico. He's there uh, with, I think, 14 people from our church, and they're going to be there all week, so we're excited for them. We miss them, but we'll be praying for God to use them in a great way. If you're a guest of ours today, I hope that you've already felt just a very warm welcome and welcoming environment to you. We're excited you're here with us today. What I would ask for everyone to do is to look at their worship guides. If you're a guest, if you would find that worship guide, uh, a spot to fill out some of your information. Now, we don't sell that information. We just use that information. We will give you a call this week. Uh, to follow up with you just to see what you thought, if there's anything that we can do to help or to encourage you. For everyone, we're asking you to look at that because you can fill out a prayer request there and just know that the staff uh, prays for you on Tuesday mornings. So what I'm going to ask is for everyone to do is if everyone would stand, find someone that you do not know and give them a very warm welcome. And as we sing, there will be a children's time, so children, if they will come and sit down at these steps. kids how you doing yeah yeah so I got a question for you who here has friends oh that's pretty cool so I got a question for you um, does God want us to have friends yes. yeah you think so you know what? I agree with you because in Genesis 2 God tells us that well he, he says to all the angels it's not good for man to be alone you need to make him a companion so he started friendship with us right back then. Now, I got a question for you. Friends, here's a football, all right? Mark's going to help me out here, okay? Um, I'm going to throw this to Mark because we're friends and we like working together, right? Oh, he's going to throw it back? <laughs> oh! <laughs> all right, but a question for you. Um, sometimes friends let you down, right? Sometimes they drop the ball. Is that a reason for me to get mad and, and say to say, Pastor, Pastor uh, Spent, I can't believe you let me down. Uh, you're not my friend anymore. Is that a good reason? No. no. Why? Because God, Jesus told us, right, to love everyone because he loves us. Is that right? So I should forgive and he'll toss the ball back to me. Woohoo! And I catch it. Almost. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know what? I should forgive my friend when, uh, when he lets me down. It's going to happen. Because, here's why. 
he throws the ball back to me, and oh, I very well may drop the ball as well. Christ tells us that if we forgive others, we, will, we ourselves will be forgiven. Does that make sense to everybody? All righty. I'll let you go ahead and keep that ball since it's yours anyways. <laughs> Let's go ahead and, uh, and pray real quick, guys. Dear Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, that not only did you grant us life, but you granted us love and companionship. You granted friendship. You built your church around the fact that there isn't just one of us. It's all of us, your children, and your children are friends, and you are our best friend. We thank you, God. We love you, and we thank you for being our God. In Christ's name, amen. All righty. So do you guys agree with that? Is, is God our best friend? Good. And because he's our best friend, we worship him above all, correct? Please stand with us as we sing, we worship above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdom, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the your voices to him above all powers above all kings above all nature and all created things above all wisdom and all the ways of man Above all, son. 
Son of God, Lamb for sinners slain. We worship and we worship you, Lord. We worship you above all. Let's sing. Let's jump the way David did. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Those are good days. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Now, I said something earlier that might have been a mistake. I said we worship him because he's our friend. Guess what? God deserves worship without having to prove himself. God is holy. Let's sing, holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, 
Good morning, church. Good morning again, I guess I should say. So this week is the last week uh, in our sermon series out of James. Uh, next week, we'll kick off a new series called He Lives, and it will take us you know, from uh, next week all the way up to Easter Sunday. Now, you know that a people loves Jesus when they show up to church on spring break weekend, right? So... We're so grateful for everyone who is here, and for those who are not, we'll just pray for them, right? That they'll see the light, they'll love Jesus a little bit more. So we'll be in James chapter 5. As we build up to Easter, uh, we're going to have on that Easter weekend, we're going to have three sort of big events. Uh, on that Friday night, for the first time I think uh, in a while, we're going to have a Good Friday service. It'll be at 6 o'clock that Friday night. The next day, we'll have a community event called Extravaganza. It's going to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then on Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have two services, one at 8 o'clock and one at 1045. So let me just ask you to be thinking through who you are going to invite. Who are you going to invite on Good Friday? Who are you going to invite to Extravaganza? And who you are going to bring with you to church on Easter Sunday? So let me encourage you to open your Bibles to James chapter 5. You can open your Bibles, open your apps, find James 5. We're going to be in verses 13 through 20. Now today's passage is really centered on prayer. In fact, in the verses between 13 and 18, it's mentioned in every single verse, prayer. But James' point is not just about personal prayer. 
he's also encouraging us towards community prayer. And he's telling us that we as a community must be a people who pray for one another. Prayer and community, he's telling us, go hand in hand. You never see one without the other. Now you can think of other important pairings, right? In our lives, you've got peanut butter and... You got Mac and... That's right, you got Batman and... Yeah, Batgirl was okay too. You've got chili and Fritos. I'm just here to tell you. Chili and Fritos. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. No, chili and Fritos. You've got Sanford and... You don't have one without the other. Duct tape and home projects. Right? Right? That's how you fix them. And of course, you always see Don Trimbley when you see him... Outside of Sunday morning, you see Don Trimbley and Ohio State gear, right? You never see one without the other. Prayer and community, genuine community, go hand in hand. Just like the rest of these great pairings. So we're going to read along in James chapter 5, starting in verse 13, and listen as we learn what James has to say about prayer and community. What he has to say. He tells us, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if any of you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We praise you for giving us just the opportunity to gather together. We praise you for the songs that you have encouraged and inspired people to write. That we might worship you in spirit and in truth. We praise you that we can gather and hear from your word. We confess we need you in this hour. We need you to show up. We need you to lead us, to guide and direct us. So Father, we ask for your hand of blessing. We also ask, Spirit, if anybody in this room doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, speak to them today. It's in your name that we pray. Now, there is a frequently used phrase, and I think it's gotten amplified uh, because of social media, and it's the term literally. So if we have any English teachers or English majors in the room, I'm about to do you a favor. Because we use the term literally without having any idea what it means. Have you ever heard someone say, I will literally die if blank? Have you ever heard that? Or, I will literally jump off a mountain if blank. And I know this phrase has escaped my lips when the boys are arguing in the back seat. I will drive, I will literally drive this car off the road if you don't stop. Now tell me you've heard literally misused. Yeah? Because if you don't, I will literally go crazy. I mean, figuratively, (laughs) I will go crazy. So how is it misused? Well, literally is often used to express intensity. When in fact, the word actually means when something is completely true. So if you learn one thing today, don't use literally around me to mean something figuratively, or I will literally judge you. <laughs> now, a misquoted word you know, is one thing, right? Not, not just really a big deal. It doesn't have a huge impact in our world. But a misquoted or a misunderstood, misapplied verse of Scripture can have 
a major impact. Some read verse 15. You see it here. Some will read verse 15. Some will even teach on verse 15 and tell us that God answers prayers solely based on the level of our faith. And if we have enough faith, God will do what we ask Him to do. But if we don't have enough faith, or if we don't see something happen, it's because of lack of faith. But this is an egregious misunderstanding of what James is teaching us here. The devastating result of this line of thinking is that believers who are not healed when they pray must deal with a two-folded burden. Adding to their physical difficulties is the assumption that they lack faith. But this is a way of looking at faith and its results. That way of looking at faith and its results is entirely contrary to Scripture. Prayer hinges on God's will. Prayer hinges on God's will, not on our faith. A genuine, heartfelt prayer demonstrates faith. That is a prayer of faith. And to protect against a misunderstanding of this text or of any text, we should never give a word or a verse more meaning than the context requires. Instead, we must approach prayer with the faith that God listens and He answers according to His will. Prayer is dependent then not on my faith, not on my level of faith, but on the will of God. Is it in God's plan? So now that we understand what James, I think what James is teaching us in verse 15, let's learn what else we can discover about prayer. And I think there's three things we learn from this, fa- this passage. And the first is that as believers, we must pray together. We must pray together. This is James' point from verses 13 to 16. As a community of believers, we are obligated to pray for each other, to pray together. In verse 14, we're told that if any is sick, we must pray together. Believers who are sick are to receive special, special attention by the entire church. In fact, we can, although it is not mandatory. Do not read in this passage, this is what you have to do in order for someone to be healed. We can take it one step further, and a family member, a church member who is sick, can call for the pastors of the church to come to their house. They can ask us to anoint them with oil, and we will, and pray over that person. But of course, James is not insinuating that that pattern must be followed for healing, and he's not, he's definitely not telling us that there's some sort of healing power in oil. That is not what he's saying here. The power of prayer for healing is in one person only. One person only. And whether it happens with anointing oil or not, the power is in Jesus Christ. It's not in your pastors, praise the Lord. It's not in the right brand of olive oil, praise the Lord. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that people are healed. It's according to His desire, His will, and His plans. So if somebody is healed, it's because He wanted it to happen. And if somebody is not, it's because He has a purpose for it. It is He who has the power. He has the power to save and He has the power to heal. So as we pray together, we must pray with faith with the expectation that Jesus Christ can and we hope will heal, and then we submit all things to God's desire, God's plans, God's purposes on whether He will heal or not. God intends for prayer to actually bring the body of Christ together so that when one falls ill or one is in horrendous circumstances, physically, spiritually, that others in the community, that we will intervene together. Now what does this mean for us at MABC? What I'm asking for you to do is to be a church that prays together. Be a church that prays together. This is consistent what we've been asking for the last six weeks. Be a church that prays together. So let me ask you, if you are a small group Bible study leader, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a Wednesday night leader, let us not neglect this command from James that when 
we gather and where we gather as a community of believers that we pray together. Now James turns from talking about prayer to a powerful example of how we are to pray boldly. So we're to pray boldly. That's the second thing we learned from this passage. Now, Bill Ingram is not here today, but I'm going to talk about him anyway. Bill is our missions and youth pastor, and we love Bill. Bill amazes us. Bill has zero hesitation to ask people for good deals. Have you ever been around Bill? I joked with him. It took me five trips to the DMV to get my license plates. And I joked with him that if it took six, he was coming with me. Because his smile would get me those plates. So Bill is our inspiration to pray boldly because he has no hesitation wherever he goes. Next time you're buying an appliance, I'm just telling you, take Bill. Next time you're buying a car, I feel like I'm filling up his calendar, but that's fine. Next time you buy a car, take Bill because he will get you a better deal. For example, when we purchased the wood flooring, and I'm going to get the numbers all wrong here, but we spent something like, where we were supposed to spend something like $8,000, and we ended up paying $6,500. How? Bill. It, we don't even know how. We, we left. We just said, Bill, here's our order. Go take it over there. And Bill smiled. I, I suspect that he found the most lonely old lady cashier, and then he smiled, flirted a little bit, and got us 19% off the cost. Now, we have no idea how Bill does it, but Bill does it each and every time, and he always says to us, and one day I'm going to listen to him, he says, you have not because you ask not. Do you hear that, church? You have not because you ask not. And so he asks, and he asks boldly. In our passage in verses 17 and 18, James, he gives us this sort of incredible example of a prophet in the Old Testament. This prophet's name is Elijah. And Elijah, again, he uh, was responsible for helping the Israelites, helping his people follow God. That was his job. And whenever they fell short of their job of worshiping the Lord, Elijah would remind them, you need to worship God. And he went to some extreme measures to show to them that the Lord God is the only God. In fact, there was a time in which he prayed, as James reminds us here, he prays and says, God, don't let it rain in Israel for three and a half years. Now we've gone, before today, we've gone quite a few weeks, quite a few months almost, without rain. And we think it has some sort of devastating impact, right? I mean, we have to get out our water hoses and our, turn on our sprinkler systems so that our plants don't die. I haven't done that yet, so I know what's going to happen with mine. Could you imagine three and a half years? of no rain, all to remind a people, God wants your heart. After three and a half years are over, Elijah prays again, and what happens? God sends rain. Is that a mild prayer by Elijah? Is that a simple prayer by Elijah? Is that sort of a a laid back prayer by Elijah? No. He prayed boldly. Now you might ask, why does James then bring up this example? I mean, Elijah's a prophet. I'm no prophet. Elijah was able to pray and God stopped the rain. I just don't feel that same ability. And yet James emphasizes that each and every Christian, each and every believer, each and every follower of Christ has access to the kind of effectiveness in prayer that James is illustrating here in Elijah. That you and I have the same effectiveness in our prayers 
as Elijah. Now, I don't know that we should pray to God to refuse to send rain to Aurora. I'm not quite so sure that we should do that, right? So we always have to keep in mind that somewhere in our prayers, we have to find a balance, a balance between never expecting God to act and always requiring Him to act on my demand. So we pray boldly, knowing that God may grant and He may not, but we have the same effectiveness in our prayers as Elijah does. If only we would pray boldly. So let me ask you, what are you praying for? What are you praying for? Now, if you're a guest of ours or if you've been gone for a few weeks, you may not know, but our church is going through a thing called Pray 24-7. This is from when Paul tells us that we should pray without ceasing. And so we're asking the church that in prayer 24-7, 24 times in a week we pray. 17 of those 24 times pray alone. Seven of those 24 times pray together. So let me ask you, what are you praying for? And are you praying boldly? Remember, we are supposed to pray upward in praise of God, inward in confession of sin, and outward in prayer of others. And I've spoken of this before, but do you remember the difference between what we call frontline and mainline prayers. Frontline or maintenance prayers. Examples of maintenance prayers includes prayers for safe travels. It might include a prayer for healing. And these are important prayers and prayers we must pray for each other. We must pray for each other and together with each other. But as you pray 24-7 this week, do not forget to pray for front-line prayers. Now, I've never served in the military, and I know some of you have. So you've seen the dangers of the front lines, and you know what they mean. That you are under direct attack, or you are attacking the enemy. So for us, as we go to the Lord in 24-7, as we pray We need to pray boldly. So we need to pray for the lost to be saved. We need to pray for the lost to be saved for entire schools, neighborhoods, cities, states, countries to be transformed by the gospel. That's a frontline prayer. We pray boldly in our maintenance prayers for the sick to be radically healed. Or we want the sick to be radically healed for the reason to show your glory and to proclaim the gospel to others. So in our frontline prayers, we pray for the lost of Aurora. We pray for the lost of Aurora, all of them, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We pray for the lost of Centennial, the lost of Greenwood Village, the lost of the DTC, the lost of Denver, and I'm going to hit my breaking point at some point because I don't know all the cities yet. We pray for the lost to come to faith. We pray for racism to end. We pray for poverty to end. We pray for the missionaries of our church to see radical transformation of their cities and of their groups. So we pray for the Uyghur group of Central Asia. God, may they all, not some, but may they all come to faith in Christ. We're called to pray for the Hamiltons as they spread the gospel in Mali, that all of the lost in Mali are saved. Lord, all of the lost in Mali, be they saved. We pray for the church of San Luis. We pray for Iglesia La Red here in Aurora. We pray for Bethel Community Church, churches that we sponsor to see droves of people come to faith in Jesus Christ. We're to pray boldly. All of them, Lord, All of them. We know, God, that it is not your desire that a single person be lost, but that all will come to repentance. So, God, save them all. We ask boldly. Let's be inspired by Elijah. Let's be inspired by Elijah. He had the same Holy Spirit dwelling within him, empowering him, leading Him, helping Him, as you do and I do, so long as you have faith in Christ. 
the same exact Holy Spirit. So as you think, think of your place of work, or think of your family, think of your neighborhood, think of your school, and say, God, it is my desire that all of them come to faith in you. And use me in a way to reach them all. So he tells us to pray boldly. And last, we're called to pray for those who have wandered from the faith. For God to give us an opportunity to bring them back into the community of the church. James tells us in verses 19 and 20, that we are to preserve one another in the faith. Let's reread those two verses. It says, My brothers, if any of you, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, you may know that the most of the New Testament is actually comprised of letters. Now, we call them books, right? The book of Romans, the book of Ephesians, the book of James, for example, but they're actually letters. Now, it's typical that these letters ended like we might. Like, you know, say hi to Grandma, love Mark, right? That's typical how we end letters. It was typical then, and you even see those in Paul's letters, right? If you see in Ephesians Galatians and the rest, you'll see that he sort of ends it with a benediction and he's got a little bit more of a laundry list than I do. So he says, say hi to this person, say hi to this person, Uh, turn that other person back, you know, say hi to this guy and so on. But James is not typical. James is not typical and he does not end his letter in a typical fashion. What he does is he ends it with sort of a summons to action. These are the last words of his letter, and so he's telling us then what to do. And this call to action is actually pretty amazing. James tells us that we, those of us in Christ, are responsible to each other to preserve our faith in each other. And it's amazing that God has given us that responsibility. Now there has been a moment in my life that I was surprisingly given a responsibility. It was during the summer of 2002. My sister, her husband, and their baby, Anna, stayed with us before going to Central Asia as missionaries. And for whatever reason, and I'm not sure the circumstances, and I can't fathom why they did this, uh, they left their six-month-old niece, my six-month-old niece, Anna, with me for an entire evening. I was 22, and uh, I had never changed a diaper before. I had never babysat, you know, never put a baby down, never calmed a crying baby, right? I mean, just had never done it before. Didn't have kids of my own. And so they hand me over the baby, and then they leave. And for whatever reason, my parents weren't there. Uh, Janet wasn't there. I was married, so I'm not, I think she just sort of knew, and she left. (laughs) So everybody left. Uh, Because Anna had just received that day her six-month-old shots. That's right. So for those of you who don't know how bad those are, just listen to the ambient noise around you. So I know why they left her with me, right? They wanted no part of it. They said, here's Anna, we're going to dinner. Okay. They got to escape all the joys of a baby recovering from her shots. And I didn't do a great job. I know I didn't do a perfect job. Anna was sick in every way from Sunday. She cried the whole entire time. She even, I sang to her uh, Amazing Grace just over and over again. She cried through Amazing Grace, (laughs) right? Could she ever be saved? I'm not sure. But she cried through Amazing Grace the whole entire time. So even though it was surprising, even though that responsibility was surprising, I was not able to just put her in a bed and leave, right? I mean, I couldn't say with nobody else home, just say, you know what? I don't want this responsibility. Take her upstairs, put her in a crib, and leave. Couldn't do that. Wanted to do that. 
but couldn't do it. Christ has made us responsible. He has made us responsible. You may be sitting there and saying, I have no desire for that responsibility. I am not interested in one little bit to make sure that somebody else preserves in the faith, endures in the faith. I don't want that. But James is telling us we're responsible for that. We're responsible to each other to ensure that each of us who has made a decision to follow Christ, that we endure in faith to the end of our life. We don't wander. Even though we're prone to wander, do you ever feel it? You know the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave. And yet God says, James tells us that it is God's will for us to preserve one another in the faith. One pastor explained it this way, if you bring someone back from wandering from the truth, you bring him or her back into the truth of the gospel, and it's only there where all of our sins are covered. What is the first step that we must do to make sure that we preserve each other in the faith? We're just going to look at one step, because it's a big first step. It means that our care for each other must intensify. Care intensifies when criticism and gossip vanishes. We will not care for those that we think of in an unkind or an ungodly way. If there is someone in this church that you think of of in an unkind or ungodly way, you will not be able to care for them and help them preserve in faith to the end. We must, must care for each other, must love each other, encourage each other, edify or build up each other. That's what we are called to do. But if we say unkind words, we think unkind thoughts, we give unkind glances at people, we cannot do what we are called to do. That's going to impair our ability to preserve one another in the faith. If we gossip, we criticize, or if we even just think about it, if we treat someone any less than we would want to be treated, we cannot preserve each other in the faith. If we spent half the time taking our concerns about people directly to them in gentleness and in love, as we're told to do in Galatians 6.1, in Galatians 6.1, rather than a complaining about that person to others, we would all be healthier individually and collectively as a church, if we would go to people, share our heart, encourage and love, our church would be built up. We would preserve each other in the faith. We cannot care for people when we think of them in unkind or ungodly ways. So Christ made us responsible. He made us responsible to each other to preserve in the faith. Of course, there's going to be people who do not listen to our kind or gracious correction. And they're going to continue to wander, and then we must just pray for them. But we preserve each other in the faith when we use kind and encouraging words. So our first step must be to banish any of those words, those thoughts, those glances about each other. Banish them from our hearts. Banish them from our behaviors. Because we are called to be a people who build each other up, not tear one another down. Kind words encourage perseverance in the faith and in the body of Christ. And let's make that the reputation of the church. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We praise you for the words that you give to us today for the words that you shared with us through James. I pray that we will pray together, that we will pray boldly, and that we'll preserve one another in the faith. And we confess, Father, none of us, none of us is perfect. And so when we fail, we pray that you will pick us back up. And Father, we ask if there's anyone in this room who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, 
Spirit, speak to them today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Bryce and I are going to be standing down front in just a moment as Foster leads us in song. If you'd like to learn more about that faith in Jesus Christ, if you want to have the same belief and confidence that God will listen to you when you pray, a belief and confidence that Jesus hears you, Pastor Bryce and I would love to visit with you about it. If you're in need of prayer, we'll be down front for you. Or if you simply just want to join our church family, we will be here to you. These steps are open in case you're in need of prayer. Let me ask you to please stand as Foster leads us in song. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you, all to you. I'm singing you this song, I'm waiting at the cross, and all the world holds dear. I count it all as loss for the sake of knowing you, the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your pain. And I surrender all to all to you and I surrender all to you all to you Amen Please join me in prayer Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for James' encouraging words, uh, as well as the words that are a little more hitting. Help us to take them to heart, all in every part of it. Uh, help us to treat each other with kindness. And, and part of that is through our tithes and our offerings, but uh, all of that comes from obedience to you. The, uh, forgive us where we're stiff-necked and rebellious people and lead us in just that gentle way that you do the, uh, to uh, your blessings. Father, bless the tithes and offerings that are coming forward, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob. It's great to be with you again this morning uh, to hear the word from Pastor Mark. And you, as a congregation, continue to amaze me, and I'm so proud of you. Every time we ask you for something or reach out, you always seem to, to meet and exceed that. And I'm happy to tell you this morning, we've gotten over 3,500 eggs so far uh, towards our 5,000 goal. And so I am confident within the next couple of weeks that we will finish that off. Uh, so please don't stop. We still need that last 1,500. Uh, but you guys have done an amazing job uh, bringing those eggs filled with just a small toy or a piece of candy. And uh, so we are so thankful for that. And I know all the kids who come to Extravaganza will be very appreciative of that. So, uh, so thank you for that. Also, uh, Pastor mentioned this is spring break. Uh, and so we will be not be having any Wednesday night activities uh, this week. And so uh, leaders and attendees, you have a, a week off to relax and enjoy uh, what hopes to be good weather. I don't know. We go from 80s to snow, so who knows? It's Colorado, right? Uh, but anyway, we'll have no Wednesday evening activities this week. Uh, please be aware of that. And also, we have a, um, some new men's groups starting up. Uh, we've finished 
uh, the spiritual boot camp a couple weeks ago, and as a follow-up to that, we're having some eight-week Bible studies that will kind of focus on that passage in the life of David. And so there's going to be Tuesday morning at 9.30, Wednesdays at 6, and Saturday mornings at 8. So if you're a man and you would like to join in that, we would love to have you be a part of one of those groups and walk through that journey over the next eight weeks uh, with the men leading those groups. And Pastor Mark mentioned Pastor Bill. Uh, he and 14 others, excuse me, 13 others are in Mexico today, right? And they are on mission. So although we talk about Bill as he prays and asks boldly, Bill also serves boldly along with those others from our church who are down there. And so this week, please lift them up in prayer. Uh, keep them in your thoughts um, and just lift them up to the Lord that what they're doing, the work that God would use that and honor that and glorify that for his name and that those would come to know Jesus through their work. And last but not least, if you're uncomfortable walking an aisle and you're not sure uh, about walking down front while we sing our invitation song, Pastor Mark and I will be down front for a few moments after the service. We'd love an opportunity just to chat with you, pray with you, whatever may be on your heart today. We want to make that available to you this morning. Foster, close us out this morning. I was asked to mention real briefly, handbells will not be rehearsing this afternoon. So if you're part of that, you get a break. Please stand with us as we uh, close out our service with Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth, that's all of you too. Have a great week. God bless.